Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word together. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were in chapter 12 at uh, verses 21 and 22. So we're moving rapidly toward the end of the chapter. And I repeat again, this is God's word. To, to be sure, Paul wrote it, but it's God's word. Uh, Paul wrote what God gave him to write. Uh, Paul was fitted from his mother's womb to be the tool that God would use to complete his word. So we're not looking at Paul's reasoning. We're not looking at Paul's logic. We're not looking at his thoughts, his ideas. We're looking at the word of the sovereign God who loves us with an everlasting and, and tremendous love which is written to us in language which I believe he expects us to understand. I believe God has written in simple and open language, so I believe he expects us to take it literally. And I expect that he expects us to study to show ourselves approved. We've been introduced to the body of Christ. In fact, the 12th chapter has, has, has spent quite a bit of time just pointing out that the, the body and, and using the, the, the physical body as an illustration of us as together being Christ's body. Uh, it's quite remarkable when you think about it. I believe the church as the, the body of Christ is that mystery that wasn't revealed in previous generations, but it was revealed uh, through his apostles. And you'll note in verses 27 and 28, now are you the body of Christ, the definite article is not there, you are Christ's body, and members in particular. God has set some in the church, uh, Christ's body, the church. And I believe that's the mystery that was concealed in, in times past. In the church, we have Jew and Gentile as one body. That doesn't mean that God is, has put away his covenants with the nation of Israel. You know, there's a huge, huge difference between the nation of Israel, whose uh, blessings were primarily earthly, and uh, the spiritual body of Christ, whose blessings are basically heavenly. The Holy Spirit has had Paul use the human body as an illustration of Christ's body. And we can read through the illustration, and I think very simply miss the main point. Our human body functions together in harmony. Uh, if you uh, hit your thumb with a hammer, your, your thumb hurts. But, uh, but you, as a whole body, hurt. And if things go good, you rejoice. The body works as a, a functioning whole. And those members of the body, which uh, we think to be less honorable, Upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. The focus, folks, is always on others, not ourselves. Okay? Uh, but what do we say? We say, well, these they lack. They seem to be lesser parts of the body. And now, almost without exception, Bible teachers have seen commentaries and other articles written uh, have said 
that these uncomely parts, well, those are the sexual parts of the body, and that may be. I, I don't know. Uh, I seem to often be at odds sometimes with the majority position. If they are the sexual parts, you know, sometimes they're very important. But there are parts of the body that we seldom think about. You know, the, the stomach, uh, the taste buds, the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, you know, we don't normally typically Typically, we don't think about the internal organs of the body, but they're just as much members of the body. But I think we should go beyond just the sexual orientation of those verses. I'm not saying it isn't part of that. I don't know. Uh, it may be that what the Holy Spirit is saying here is we have certain parts of the body that we don't want to display. I think that's what he's saying here, is we have certain parts of the body that we don't think that much about, or we don't think that highly about, of, and uh, that sort of thing. You know, you could come up with all kinds of illustrations, you know. Uh, you know, the taste buds, you know, they say, man, oh man, you know, isn't that good? That's delicious. Never tasted anything as good as that in my whole life. And, and the stomach says, well, you may think that's good. But let me, let, me, let me tell you, there's very little nourishment in what you're eating, in, in what you're consuming. And we need that stomach to tell us that. You know, do we really think about us as the body of Christ? There are members of the body of Christ that are important to the body, and we need them. And we tend to think highly of our parts. Maybe we don't think much very highly of ourselves. Uh, you know, these, these parts, whether they're comely or uncomely, I mean, we really do. No, no woman out there wants to lose a breast. No man wants to lose his manhood. Uh, no human I know of enjoys having parts of his body operated on and removed. They're important to the body. So are we, as members of Christ's body, uh, I, folks, the easiest thing is to be critical and, and unloving of other members of the body. The biggest problem, and one that we may, we may deal with a little bit later, is... Sometimes it's difficult to know whether a person is, in fact, a member of the Christ's body. And it seems to me the option in that case is love. And we'll get into that in the 13th chapter. You know, there are, there are sections of our body that aren't comely. Okay, but there aren't any sections of our body that are not essential. So every single member, every single member, including you, of the body of Christ is there for a reason. And we need one another. Uh, God put those there as the members of his body. The text says our comely parts have no need. God has tempered the body together, having given more, more abundant honor to those parts which seem to be lesser parts. You don't see much of that today. You know, uh, he did that in order that there wouldn't be any division in the body, but, that the, but so that the members would have or should have the same care, the same concern for each other. And that's the way that we ought to be. Our, our, our human body functions that way. You know, why is it uh, inconceivable that Christ's body should not function that way? These Corinthians that, that we're reading about here came behind in no spiritual grace, and yet they're acting as though they're carnal. You know, we can act as though we're carnal. You know, we can act as though we're spiritual. We're, we are spiritual. 
uh, we're not carnal. We can only act carnal. The Corinthians were acting as though they were made of flesh when in fact they're spiritual creatures. So I'm persuaded that the new creations in Christ Jesus function according to the illustration that's been given to us here. Uh, function in the same manner in which our human body functions. And yet, look at the jealousy that exists among Christians or the doubt among Christians about as to what God's given them. Okay. <clears throat> you know, there's great numbers of divisions. Christians don't get along very well. I've, I've had Christian businessmen uh, tell me, you know, they'd much rather deal with unbelievers than they would believers, you know, because, uh, you know, they find that uh, unbelievers, uh, they find them to be more honorable in their business dealings. And, you know, folks, that's a, that's a pathetic thing for a businessman to say. We should function as new creations in Christ Jesus in the same harmonious way that the human body functions so that there's no division in that body. Verse 26, and whether one member suffer, or if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it, or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Okay, that's not a difficult illustration. At, at my age, that verse is pretty, pretty clear. You know, when one member suffers, well, the whole body suffers with it. I mean, it just does. You know, I, I don't feel well. You know, I ache. Well, well, Steve, where's the ache at? Well, every place between my head and my body, you know, and, or, or every place between my head and my foot, you know, my whole body. When one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member's honored, all the members rejoice with it. You know, and the Holy Spirit, he could have had Paul use different illustrations. The, uh, you know, you got your, you got a, the quarterback throws a, a 55 yard pass. It's caught and ran for a touchdown and everybody cheers. But, you know, that quarterback would have never have done that if those members of the team who are his defense gave him enough time to, to take his stance and throw that pass. but the quarterback gets all the praise. Of course, folks, we are to give more abundant honor to those parts which seem to be lesser parts. Of course, we, we may have certain parts of the body that we don't think that much about, that we don't hold in such high esteem, but we are being told right here to give these members more abundant honor. Why? Why? Because they're lacking in some spiritual grace? No. No. Uh, you know, but because their need to know that they're not lacking in any spiritual grace is greater than the member which knows that he or she is not lacking in any spiritual grace. Dearly beloved, if, if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member's honored, well, the body's honored. And it is a, a selfish thing to want it for ourselves. Our, our spiritual gifts, the one that, that God gave us, they're not for us. Our spiritual gifts are for others, not ourselves. Any number of Bible teachers and pastors have boasted about the church that they built 
you know, if they built the church, well, it isn't worth anything. If, if God built it, it's the, it's the church that God wants. It, and it's God who put the body together. Verse 27, now ye are Christ's body and members in particular. You know, get rid of the definite article. It's not there. You are Christ's body. And you are members in particular. Members. There are members in that body, and it's God who set some in the church. God did the setting, folks. All right? I, I mentioned I thought this was at Pentecost. God gave you your members. God put the members in your human body. God put the members in Christ's body. God has set some in the church. The church is Christ's body. The church is, is not the first Baptist church of some, of I don't know, Helena, Montana, okay? It's the, the, the church is not blessed hope forever, all right? Or any other denomination uh, any other denominational church someplace else. It is that living organi organism called Christ's body, and we have different functions. The eye can't say to the hand or the ear, you know, can't say, you know, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that makes, that makes obvious sense. Why isn't that true of Christ's body? And then we come to verse 28. God hath set some in the church, first apostles, second uh, secondly uh, uh, prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, gifts of then gifts of uh, of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all uh, prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of, of miracles? Have all gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. Okay, he didn't say anything about uh, interpretation back in verse 28, but he adds it here. Uh it is God who's doing the speaking, so he didn't have to say it back there. I have two or three paragraph uh, articles where uh, uh, the consideration was, well, why, why do you suppose that Paul left that out? Well, he just forgot it. You know, he, he got, he got kind of forgetful in his old age. He, 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 he got forgetful there when he penned verse 28, and then he thought, he'd, well, he'd sneak it in on us here in verse 30. Uh, that's not the way you come to this book, folks. This is God's word, not Paul's. Do all interpret? No. Dearly beloved, I think that the greater gifts that are about to be mentioned are those, to, if we're going to be consistent with this, this book, are those gifts in others that we don't have. And so we come to the end of the chapter, verse 31, but covet earnestly the greater gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Covet earnestly the greater gifts. So there are, we have to, we have to accept the fact that there are greater gifts. But note that the Holy Spirit does not list what those gifts are. There are gifts which he considers to be greater. That's the first conclusion that we have to draw from that verse. There are those that are greater. And then from then on, people come up with all kinds of ideas as to what those gifts are. But the Holy Spirit does not tell you or me what those are. He, he doesn't list those, uh, what those are. So how do I earnestly desire something, you know, or those gifts or graces if, if I don't know what they are? It doesn't make sense. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think the answer is, but that doesn't make it right, and I never ask anyone to agree with me. Just think about it, 
okay? I struggle with this just like everybody else does. God says there are greater gifts, but God has already, already told the Corinthians that they were not coming behind, lacking in any spiritual gift. That, he, that he's given us, God, that he has given us whatever gifts that we have. So it appears that we have a contradiction of sorts. Because now I'm being told to covet earnestly, uh, that is be jealous for, in the Greek, be eager for, seek after the better gifts or the greater gifts. The word means greater. And that's a present imperative. That is a command that we're to do that. So how in the world, how in the world do I make sense out of that phrase? Well, one of the first things that you, you find in the literature is, well, you know, okay, since you have, uh, you know, this such awesome free will, you know, and, and you see that that's just assuming that you do, since you have free will, and since God gives the gifts, uh, then he gives them with man's cooperation. All right, you know, you can sort of, you know, enter into this uh, dialogue, this compact with God, you know, about which gifts that you'd like, and, you know, maybe he'll give them to you, give you greater gifts than what he already gave you. You know, the problem with that, folks, is that God has sovereignly ordained those gifts. You know, like Paul separated from his mother's womb. You know, surely Paul didn't have any free will choice of what his gifts might be. I don't think that you, we can read into the verse any semblance of free will that, you know, you have some choice as to what gifts you get. However, if, if I'm earnestly desiring those gifts that are greater, doesn't that infer a choice? So, you know. So one of the suggestions made is that God will give gifts with the cooperation of man and his free will. Since God is, has already given the gifts, then some suggest that we're not looking at those kinds of gifts, but that this verse is looking at moral values. You know, just try to be, try to be a good guy, try to be a good person in the way that you live. You know, so that's another suggestion made by uh, commentators and, and articles. And another one that I see suggested is that, well, what that means is, you know, try your best to improve the gifts that you already have. You know, that this means an, an eagerness to improve the gifts that you already have, that you've already received from God. It doesn't seem to jive with all the rest of Scripture. It doesn't seem to jive with, you know, you should be earnestly seeking the, the best gifts but, uh, but that's one that's made. One of the more commonly held views is that, you know, uh, if you do have a choice of the gifts that, that you have, then you ought to try to choose the, 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 the best ones, the greater gifts. But you can look at verses 8 to 11 and, and verse 28. And it seems to, well, it seems to indicate to, to me that choice doesn't make any sense. So, so then you get down to my view. Always good to have another view, I suppose, unless it's the wrong one. It's, and folks, I've struggled over this. I'm not trying to twist this text. I've rest, wrangled with this, ver, this verse. I'm suggesting that this eagerness here, this earnestness uh, toward the greater gifts is telling me that I'm going to be more interested in the exercise of another member's gift in my life. One that I was not given, 
than the ones that I was given, which were not given for me, but for others, because the ones given to others were given for me. You know, if my concern is really for the benefit of the body as a whole, not just myself, then I am most eager for those spiritual gifts, graces, that's the word, grace, that others have, which were not given to them for themselves, but for me, God gave some in the church, first apostles. I'm persuaded that the apostle had certain re, uh, apostleship had certain requirements, that there aren't apostles anymore. I think an apostle had to have been with Christ and seen Christ resurrected. I do not believe that apostleship has been present since the death of John the Apostle in 96 to 100 AD, whenever that was. So I don't believe that there are apostles in the church today. Kind of sets me at odds with a lot of the, the charismatics. but uh, And then there's prophets. I don't think there are prophets in the church today. I think we're looking at the formation of the body of Christ. Keep this in context, context, historical context, context. Uh, and the gifts that are in the subject of our present text have all passed away. Now I get a lot of criticism for that, and that's okay. I think they're all summed up in this. We have this book now. I don't think there are prophets anymore because I don't think they're needed. I wish that I had the ability to tell you folks in, just in, in straightforward terms just how wonderful I think it is, how marvelous, how unbelievably privileged we are to be able to, to hold God's word in our hand. I can't imagine the, the treasure that you have or, or, or an experience you, you've ever gone through that can equal picking up this book, the word of the sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and to read his love letter to you. The, the, the greatest thing in the world that I can think of. I can't imagine anything in my life that compares with opening this book and reading the word of the sovereign God. I don't think he has any more to say to you folks than what he's already said in this book. I don't believe there are there are apostles because I think God hasn't any more to say than what he's already said here. And I believe it's his, his complete word. This is God what, this is, folks, this is what God wants me to know. And many of us, including myself, don't spend as much time in it that that, that I I think well we I just don't think we spend as much time in it as we we should. It is a privilege beyond the ability to to explain or comprehend just to hold this book in your hand. You know, I mean, I heard about some guy who who trembled when he he held in his hand the original copy of the Declaration of Independence, and I thought. You know, well, you know, it might be something to tremble over, I suppose, you know, and be amazed at, you know, and we hide it under glass. But it doesn't equal this book. It doesn't equal God's Word. I don't think that we need apostles anymore because we have God's Word. I don't, I don't think we need prophets because I have God's Word. Guess what we do need, folks? We need one another. And the gifts that God's given us. This book contains all the prophecy I need to know. That he wants me to know. Thirdly, teachers. I'm a teacher. But I need teachers. 
I eagerly seek after that gift. You know, I, if I think someone's a great teacher of the word, I want everything I can get from the guy. However, that, that may not be the gift that another member of Christ's body eagerly seeks after. You know, it may be one of these other gifts that's more suited to, to his or her present need. You know, I guess I'm a teacher, but I prefer folks to be taught. I mean, I need taught. I need to be taught by someone. I, and I earnestly seek that. And I consider that a greater gift, not in myself, but in somebody else, because I need that teaching. I've never honest, I, let, me, let me just say this. I have, I've never earnestly sought miracles, okay? Many do, but I think these gifts were temporary. But we have God's word, and it's by means of God's word that I'm persuaded you know, scripturally, and folks, the, 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 ne the, great, the next great outbreak of miracles will be under Satan's domain, Satan's administration. So I'm suspicious of miracles, of healings. You know, those are all there. We discuss them more when we get in, you know, uh, the 13th chapter, I'm suggesting, and you don't have to agree with me, that this eagerness is not that you get some other unmentioned gift that's greater in quality than the gifts that you've received, but that you be taught, encouraged, comforted, fed, by those who have a gift that you may not have. Those gifts being the greater gifts. Those are those greater gifts that are mentioned. Those are the greater gifts. That's what I'm suggesting. I understand when we read this, especially just reading the King James, that on the surface it sounds as if that these greater gifts are those that we seek that are kind of on top of what the gifts that we've already received. And so these are gifts that we acquire, we seek after, earnestly seek after, and we acquire for ourselves that are over and beyond the gifts that we already have or might already have. That's how it, re that's how it seems to sound when you read it in the King James, uh, folks, I do not believe that's what we're looking at at all. The word greater does mean greater. But if we're to be consistent with this book and not contradict ourselves as we go along and not just kind of fill in the blank, you know, we've got a lot of white spaces there, fill in the blanks. What are these greater gifts? Well, these greater gifts are anything we can imagine, I guess. Or, or it's just our greater, if we look at the greater gifts as, well, there's, there's some greater gifts, and those greater gifts are the ones we haven't received. Well, why haven't we received them? You know, so God just chose to give us gifts that are not as great as he did others. So there's some, some gifts that are greater in, in, in that sense, okay? You know, as far as the gifts are, are concerned, there's greater gifts than others. Folks, I don't believe that. I think, I think as far as ranking goes, I think prophecy, you know, uh, ranked right up there is, is just as great as miracles or tongues or interpretation of tongues. Folks, there's, no, there's nothing greater in that sense. You know, it's just like, like me. There's nothing greater about me than there is you and vice versa. No, no, no. What I'm to earnestly seek after, long after, be jealously eager for, though, is what is those gifts that you're, those God gave you to help me. I've already received what God's given me. 
you know, as far as spiritual graces are concerned. I think that's what the text is saying. That's going to carry us over into chapter 13. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all your prayers for the direction of this ministry. I ask you right now to, to take a moment, if you would, to pray for those for healing for those who are sick. Uh, many of us are struggling in our, our, you know, there's difficulties within the body. We have the same care for one another. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.